Is God good all the time? When we think of crucifixion, we think of Christ, of course, and we think maybe of the classic paintings of him on the cross. And crucifixion is a very sacred association, um, very tender, um, and it's also very sanitized, too. Um, in the ancient world, crucifixion was your worst nightmare. And it was invented by the Phoenicians, I understand, and it was refined by the Romans into what would be the worst form of execution that you could possibly experience. Uh, you were literally tortured to death for days. And I understand that the record for the longest crucifixion was about two weeks. And so what happened here? Um, the nails were put between the, let's see, between the radius and the ulna right here um, so that the, the, the bones of the arm would hold up the body on the cross. If they were placed in the palms of the hands, the, the weight of the body would tear through the soft tissues of the hand and just and the, the person would fall off the cross. So um, Ezekiel 23, 42 describes the hand and the, um, the, the explanation of that is that the hand was anything between, between the fingertips and the elbow. Um, in biblical definition. So um, the one who was crucified would hang on the cross. They, they would hang down and they would breathe, but they would not be able to exhale. So they would struggle for breath. And of course, the more you breathe, the more you take into your lungs. And if you can't exhale, it's only becoming more and more pressure. And so they would panic and they would raise themselves up by on the cross by their feet, which of course were the nails. They had nails in their feet also. And, and they would raise themselves up on the cross and be able to breathe for until the, uh, the, the pains in their legs and their feet and the cramping and all of that just became unbearable and they couldn't take it anymore. And so they would sink back down onto the cross and they would breathe and not be able to exhale. And so they would raise themselves up again, panicking. And, and this cycle was repeated over and over again until you died. And this was why they wanted to break the legs of the thieves who were crucified with Jesus is because if they broke their legs, then they would not be able to raise themselves up on the cross and breathe, and they would just suffocate quickly and die. Terrible. Satanic invention, crucifixion was. And so it says in Psalms twenty-two, eighteen, and for my clothing they cast lots. You know, we see these paintings where there's a loincloth around Jesus, around those who were crucified with him, but that really wasn't the custom. Uh, part of the part of the torture of crucifixion was the shame and being held up completely exposed to the gawking masses. And um, the crucifixion actually happened at the crossroads of the ancient world. Jerusalem was at the center of the world because all roads may have led to Rome, but all roads went through Jerusalem. The, the, there were, Jerusalem was, was between three continents, um, Africa was not too far away. Uh, the, the roads came up from Egypt and Libya and Ethiopia, from Africa into Jerusalem. Uh, they came upwards northwest from the Arabian Peninsula. They came 
west from Persia and India and places like that, and they and the roads went from Jerusalem went northwards into Turkey, Asia Minor, Europe, Rome. Jerusalem was a crossroads of the world, and being a crucified outside Jerusalem there like that, it was like being crucified at the East Los Angeles interchange, which is the busiest interchange in the United States. And my husband used to drive it every day. I used to drive it in the evenings. I worked in the evenings in Los Angeles and I would go into work and just drive through that thing every day. And it was terrible. Sometimes it was a parking lot. But anyway, Jesus was not crucified in any out-of-the-way spot. He was held up to the world, literally. And these spectacles of crucifixion had turned into scenes of entertainment. People would watch and gawk and eat their popcorn, so to speak. And <clears throat> it was just... It was just all around a torture to be crucified. And, <clears throat> okay, that's that's the physical. What about the psychological aspects of crucifixion? Just as one who's crucified was, was exposed physically, so they were, they also became more and more psychologically exposed as pain, unremitting, unrelenting, ceaseless pain wore down their their psychological persona, if you will. You know, when when I was a young woman and I was going to school, um, I was going to a small college in uh, Northern California, and it was, depending on how fast I drove, it was like between six and seven and a half or so hours away from my parent from my parents home in Los Angeles to the college up in the Napa Valley and are actually on a mountain surrounding the Napa Valley but anyway uh, I had spent spring break at my parents house and I drove back up to school and I was tired lay down took a nap fell asleep for a couple of hours and I woke up and I had a very sour stomach and I don't know I just couldn't get rid of it I didn't sleep well that night and um, the next day I was supposed to register for my spring quarter and I couldn't do that because I was sick and I was vomiting and had all these I was I was just ill and the student health service they thought maybe I had the flu or something and to make a long story short, I was in unremitting pain for about two days. And then about, it was more than 48 hours. That I, I had come up on a Sunday and started to get sick Sunday night. And then by, by Tuesday night, I was just curled up in a fetal ball on the floor of my dorm room, just sobbing. And I hated to cry in front of people, but I, I just couldn't keep that psychological persona up anymore and I just couldn't do it so I was out there just crying in front of my roommate in front of the nurse who came and anyhow but that's how it was uh, that with uh, under under ceaseless pain you you can't hold up and you become psychologically exposed. The first thing in Genesis 3-7, after Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat, and <clears throat> it says here in Genesis 3-7, And their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The first thing that happened after Adam and Eve sinned was they they had a consciousness of being exposed and they they that they didn't like that 
And so they had an urge to cover themselves. And, you know, we all have these psychological personae as well as clothing. Uh, people ask us how we're, ask us how we're doing and we, we say, oh, fine. And, and, and I suppose in this unsafe world, we do need that. But when unremitting pain strips that psychological persona away, then we reveal our true selves. And um, Jesus, actually, that's what happened to him on the cross. Um, he was not only in, in physical pain, but he was also in, in spiritual agony. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Well, Christ was crucified and hanged on a tree. And Galatians 3, 13 says, Christ became a curse for us. Infinite purity became a curse for us. At age nine, I had this dream where I, the Lord had returned and I was not ready. I I was a lost person, and I just remember the sick dread that I felt at that time, and Jesus experienced that on the cross because he was condemned in our place, and it was, Jesus was in fact standing before the judgment bar of God at this point when he was, he was on the cross, and the Lord was condemning him in our place and basically turning his face away from him and saying, depart from me, you cursed. He took, he took our condemnation. He was accounted wicked at the judgment bar of God so that we would never have to be. And this, this is such a vast subject. It's something that I think we're probably going to be studying and, and learning new things about throughout eternity. Um, but he, God turned his face away from his son and gave him our condemnation. And he paid the penalty for our sins with his blood and by being condemned in our place. And, okay, Jesus is, Jesus revealed who he was on the cross. You know, when, when the seven last plagues are falling on people, they're going to be cursing God. They're going to be in unremitting pain and agony and discomfort and all of these things. And, they're, they're not going to be saying, Oh Lord, what have we done? Please forgive us. Tell us how we can make this right. There's not going to be a trace of that. They're just going to be cursing God and not repenting of their deeds. And their pain is going to reveal who they are. Well, Christ's pain on the cross revealed who he was. He said, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? He, he knew he was going to go, go through this, but when the time came, it was so painful. But he didn't curse. He didn't, he, there was no hatred. There was no anger in him. There was just only heartbreak. Father, why are you turning away from me? But he still called the Lord Father. How did he get through it? You know, he prayed that last prayer, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He, he put his faith in God. You can see it right there. He, he said, you're still my father. I'm putting my hand, myself in your hands. I'm trusting you anyway. And that was a Hebrew child's prayer for the time, kind of like, now I lay me down to sleep. He just put his trust in his father 
as if he was a small child. And that's how he got through it. And that's how we get through life, is by putting our trust in him. Now the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, Satan came to him and he said, Oh, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you're the son of God, he took him up onto the height of the temple and said, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down and the angels will catch you. And the last temptation, he took him up to a high mountain and he showed him the kingdoms of all the world and their glory and said, I'll, I'll give you all this if you'll only fall down and worship me. <clears throat> he showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Well, what is the glory of the kingdoms of the world? <coughs> Excuse me. Is, is it the pyramids? Did Satan show him the pyramids or the Colossus, if that was there at the time? and Or did he show him some temples and China and beautiful architecture. What did Satan show Jesus? And why was this such a hard temptation to resist? Satan showed him the people. Satan showed him us, all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, I will give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. But you know, God doesn't work that way. See, Satan is willing to buy and sell us like horses and trade us off like cattle. But that's not the way God works ever. God allows free choice. And let's say this transaction had taken place. Satan would go to his followers and say, Okay, you belong to God now. I've traded you off. And they would say, we don't want to go with God. We want to stay with you. You're, you're what we're about. Your principles, your kingdom, That this is what we want. Satan would say, that's not my problem. I traded you off. Get going. He doesn't care about us at all. But God doesn't do that. He allows us all to have a free choice. He will not hold anyone to himself that doesn't want to be with him. He'll, he will let them go. He'll try to win them back, but if they won't, he's not going to hold anyone to him by force. And, you know, this is amazing here. Jesus died so we, we could have a choice, and even if no one were saved, he would... He would still respect that. And he wouldn't hold one person to himself. Would that mean that he would have died for nothing? No, because the angels and the rest of the universe would see the depth of God's love and respect for his created beings. And, and they would know that he would do the same thing for them, too. What can we say? Is God good all the time? 